All right, good afternoon. There we go. All righty, how is everyone? Awesomeness. If, if anyone did not get a grade on PA1, let me know. I had one student who, you know, I had a grade in my grade book, but it didn't make it into Canvas for some reason. Everyone should have a grade at this point, so if you didn't get a grade, let me know. It's probably pilot error on my part. All right, how's PA2 coming? Let's start off with questions on... Uh, on PA2. Uh. Haven't started, uh oh. Um. Are we all right to use regex for stripping non alphabetic? characters um, as long as you're writing the code yourself you can do that but I guarantee it's easier to do what we described in class which is just go through and um, see if the character is a letter and if so um, append it to a string but let me let me clarify something on on the character so I had said something like um, word dot character at I dot is letter and that actually does not work um, because the is letter method is is one of these statics that I've said we're mostly going to ignore um, is letter is is a method that we can invoke without having a particular character to call it on. So if we look at is letter, um, it says that it's a static and it accepts an argument which is a character. So thinking in terms of objects, right, if we have a string and we want to know its length, we say string dot length, right? If we have a string and we want to convert it to uppercase, we say string dot to uppercase. If we have a character and we want to know if it's a letter, we don't say the name of that character dot is letter like I, I think I did in lecture the other day. What we really do is we call this method as a static or class method inside the character class. So we say character dot is letter. And then we pass to that method the character that we're asking about, which for us might be word dot character at argument i and that will give us a boolean telling us if the ith character of this string is a letter or not so just a point of clarification on that um, which I totally did with the wrong window up so instead of saying word character i is letter we do uh, word character i that's a character pass that as an argument to the static method is letter in the character class. So character dot is letter parentheses and then the character we're asking about. All right, um, confused about what we need for our two strings. So the result of two strings should be a list of each word in your index followed by a list of the locations where that word occurs. Okay, similar to to what you see in the assignment description. Which shows this. So in my case, I built up my index. This is what the two string method returned. All right, so inside curly brackets, I've got each word equals and then inside square brackets a comma separated list of the locations where that word occurs you do not have to do any work for that right just return your index dot two string return value so indexers two string method is really just if you called your 
index index is just return index dot two string for n for n. So yeah, just use your other methods. And and really, you know, the bulk of the work is gonna be done for you by stuff that's inside the other classes. So so how do we add a word to um, to our hash map? Let's say we have a hash map. And to declare our hash map, right, we need to specify the type of key and the type of value. So the type of key is a string. The value associated with a key is going to be a linked list. And it's a linked list of integers. And I'm just going to call this map. I think it's supposed to be called index in the assignment. So here's how I could declare my hash map to be a map where my keys are strings and my values are linked lists of integers. And you got to use uppercase I integer instead of lowercase I N T because this has to be an actual class, but it works the same as integers. <laughs> and I think that works fine. Um, it's, it's kind of ASCII specific. This is a private message. It's, it's kind of ASCII specific, but I'm not going to test it with non-ASCII characters. Um, but in general, using the character dot is letter method is going to work better for internationalization, for different character sets and so on and so forth. But for this, for this um, assignment, that should work perfectly fine. All right, so here's my map. You can construct it by saying map equals new hash map, all of this stuff, paren paren. Right as usual. So how do I how do I add a word to my map? Well, I can say map, and I can use the put method, and I can put the word, and then I want to associate with that an empty linked list. So how do I do that? Well, I could just do new linked list, angle bracket integer, something like that. So this is if word not found. Well, how do I know if the word is in my map? Well, map.get. So let's let's look at the hash map. And if I call the get method, that will will return the value associated with the key or null if the map contains no mapping for the key. So I can say map.get word and check the result. If it's null, then I know the word's not already in the hash. And in that case, I can add it to the hash by doing this put. And this puts it in associated with an empty linked list. And then how do I add a new node containing an n to the end of the linked list associated with word inside my hash map? It's easier than saying it. Map dot, um, get word that's going to give me a linked list a linked list has a method called add which adds to the end of the linked list if i add n that will do it that's going to go into my hash map find the thing where this word is stored find the linked list associated with it return it here call that linked list add method with an argument of n that goes to the end of that linked list, makes a new node, adjusts the pointers, and so on and so forth. And then your your um, process file is really just, you know, open the file, read a word, right, scanner.next, clean it up, clean up word, add it to your hash, that's just the add reference method. And you don't really do a whole lot of work until you get into add reference. And add reference is really like about three lines of Java. 
see if the word's in the hash. If it's not, add it with an empty linked list, and then get the linked list associated with the word, use its add method to make a new node at the end. So you've built up your hash map. All your words are stored in there, linked list next to each one that tells you how many, um, tells you where each location of that word is. Um, so how do you tell how many unique words you have in your hash map? We have this, this method you're supposed to write, which is called a uh, number of words. So yeah, how do we know how many words there are in the index? Um, look at the hash map. The key set contains the set of all the keys, all the words in our case. If we found the size of that key set, that would tell us how many unique words were stored. But we can also just call the size method on the hash map. That tells us the number of key value mappings. So this method that you need to write is another one-liner. Just return index.size. How about number of instances? How do we find the number of times that a particular word appears in our input file? So what does that correspond to? Mm -hmm. That's the length of the linked list associated with that word. So how do we find the linked list associated with the word? Map.getWord. Now you have to check to see if this returns null. If it does, your word's not in the index. And so you return a special code saying that it's not stored in there. But if this is not null, it's giving us a linked list that contains each location where that word occurs. If we just find the length of that linked list, that's how many times the word appeared. Well, how do we find the length of a linked list? Call it size method. So your number of occurrences simply returns this value. You got to do one extra if to make sure this isn't null, because if this is null and I try to call a size method on null, I'm going to get a null exception. But other than that, it's a one liner. Right. So this this is what you're going to start discovering more and more as we do the assignments in this course, as you move on to other courses, as you go into something like Android development or something large scale that's object oriented. You're going to find you're really just calling things and putting them together. Yeah, it's a good question. How long would this take to code up and see? I used to give this in 224 um, in some form, um, usually without the hashing. I would just do pairs of arrays. I did this once in 222 where people coded up hash maps and, and linked lists and built that up. That was a daunting assignment. And then it turns out at WSU someone was giving the same assignment. And the students who had the class that year just like sailed through it. Um, but I leave that for WSU now. But doing it in Java, totally different feeling from doing it in C. Cool. <laughs> All right, so yeah, so there's a question about um, um, how we deal with the removal of a character that isn't a letter. So this, this is a, a recurring trick. Instead of removing a character that's not a letter, let's build a new string and just add the characters that are letters. Right? So let's make an out, which is empty. Right? And then for each character in your input string, if input i is a character, Add it to your output. And then at the end, just return your output. And we can always we can always find a duel to the problem we're trying to solve, usually. Right? The direct way is remove the things that aren't letters. The the flip of that is start with an empty string, add the things that are letters. So pick off each character, you know, i goes from zero to the length minus one if character at i is a character is a letter um then append it to the output string so is a letter and when you're done your output string is the things that 
that were letters. All right, other PA2 questions. All right, let's talk about iterators. Um, hash maps are this, this classic kind of structure where we have a bunch of information stored in here. We'd like to be able to access that information. Um, we, can, we can turn it into a string by just calling the toString method. But if we want anything else, if we want to go through each, each entry in our hash map and do something with it or, or process it in some way, we need a way to get through all of the elements of the hash map. Um, with an array, we just make a loop. We go from 0 up to array length minus 1. With a linked list, we start from the first node, we follow the pointers to each node. With a tree, we even have a way to get through all the data. We can do like an LNR traversal or an NLR. Um, but with a hash map, there's no sort of canonical way to, to work through the data such that you hit each piece of data exactly once. So there's a way provided for us which is to use what's called an iterator. All right, so, so how does an iterator work? Well, first of all, we can say, give me the collection of all the keys in our, our hash map. So we can use the key set method, which will return an object of type set. So set is a very general um, class. It describes a collection of stuff, basically, with no duplicates. So it's like a set. And sets come with a method called iterator. And the iterator method returns an object of type iterator. And iterator is a class which comes with a few methods such as has next and next. And has next and next are ways that we can access the elements in this iterator one at a time. And they work just like has next and next for the scanner class. So let's put this together and and let's um let's iterate. And I think I've been blowing away all my code as we do this. Um, yeah. Let me see if I can get back a hash example really easily. All right, so I think this was our class from yesterday, um, mapper.java. So we, we, um, we built a hash map of strings associated with rectangles, right? So, so here was a string named 12 associated with a 1 by 13 rectangle. Greg was 25 by 25, and so on and so forth. Um, and, and we can... my rectangle class. I should just put this thing somewhere.
Yeah, I need to store my rectangle class somewhere. Okay, let's make a constructor for rectangles. So, public rectangle, integer L, integer H. Length equals L, height equals H. Constructor with no arguments. All right, we'll keep a copy of that. All right, so um, if we run Mapper, um, it it built up a hash map of of strings associated with the rectangles, and we change the square to be a thousand by thousand um, at the end there. So let's let's set up an iterator to let us go through the contents of this hash map one element at a time. Um, so we're going to iterate through the keys. Right, key value pair, strings, rectangle, string, rectangle, string, rectangle. We're going to iterate through all of the different keys. So, um, first thing we're going to do is we're going to get the key set. So we're going to use um, mymap.keyset and get a set. So set, and it's going to be a set of strings because that's the, the key value. So set angle bracket string, I'm going to call this all keys, and this is going to be equal to my map dot key set, and I think it's an uppercase S, yeah. All right, so what's happening here, go into the hash map, find the, the keys, put them into this object that's an object of type set, return that, that's what all keys is going to be, and I'm just declaring it to be a set of strings. And then let's get an iterator. So our set is going to have an iterator method, which will return an iterator. And the iterator is going to be strings. So we call the iterator method on this, this set of keys, and that gives us an iterator. And then once we have an iterator, we have this next and has next method pair that we can use like a scanner. So while iterator.has next. String this key equals iterator.next. So what's the whole setup here? Um, get a key set, use the key set to get an iterator, IT, and then while well, that iterator has a next value, get that next value, put that in a string called this key, let's just print it out. So this should give me a list of all of my keys, but it's giving it to me one at a time inside a for loop. I could be doing other things in here like you know, do some post-processing with that or output it or whatever it is that I want to do. Um, and I'm going to need some imports, so Java Utility, um, Iterator, Java Utility Set. Let me just go ahead and compile and let it yell at me.
So if I run this in my for loop, right, I'm able to, or my while loop, I'm able to access each of these keys one at a time. And my iterator apparently gave these keys to me in the same order that my two string method added them to the string. That's probably not a coincidence. But in general, there's no guarantee on what order you're going to get things back from an iterator. You're only guaranteed that you'll get each thing once and exactly once before your has next method returns false. And so we can find iterators for linked lists and sets and hash maps and all kinds of other objects. And it's, it's generally an option to, to um, give you a way to get through the elements of a structure. And I didn't have to do all this, right? I, I could have done, you know, it equals map, my map dot key set dot iterator, right? And just gotten that in one line and so on and so forth. But anyway, that's the basic idea. All right, any questions on that? All right, let's see where are we? 27, we got a little bit of time still. Um, Talk about file output. How is this different from simply printing key set? If you print key set or if you print the hash map, um, you get a copy of the contents going to your screen, right? And if that's what your goal is, that's great. But if you want to do anything else with, you know, the the list of keys. Um, you don't want to print it to your screen. You could use the two string method and then try to parse it and, you know, look for things separated by commas and so on. But if you want a way to be able to, you know, look at each element in your hash map, right? An iterator is really the way to go. Um, one thing you might, one reason why you might want to do that is to print the values out. And in that case, you can just print it, you know, and use the two string method. But there's a thousand other reasons why you, why you might want to look at each element um, in the hash map. For example, maybe you want to take each element in the hash map and open a file with that element's name, right? And, and then write into that file, you know, some information about it. Or you want to, to take each element in the hash map, each word that's associated with that, and feed that to some other function that, you know, does some kind of uh, frequency analysis on it against some other input, right? So, so it's, it's a more general way to go through the elements of a collection one at a time. All right, so file output. Um, So we, we saw how to construct a scanner that would ingest from a file. All right, so you can construct a scanner with, with a new file. We can actually construct a scanner just from a path in quotation marks. We don't need to explicitly, explicitly mention a file. Um, so a print writer is the other direction. It's, it's a way we can do output. And we can construct a print writer either with a file or directly with a file name, just as a string. Um, and this will basically create a mechanism through which we can basically print things that instead of going to our display, will go into a file. And once we have a print writer, we have all of these methods available. We have print, we have print line, 
we also have you know good old print f from c if we want to do percent d percent s and so on um and print you know we can say print a character print a, a number or an integer or a string right those are all different methods right they're all named print but they have a different signature because they take a different type of argument and we can do lower level output we can do write and just say here's a character um, array let's go ahead and write that or here's a character array right starting at this position this many characters so these mimic you know the behavior of chapter two runtime library functions like write and print writers are are one of many ways to do output to a file there's buffered writers there's stream writers there's all this other stuff print writers work really well though they're plenty good for everything we're going to do including writing to um, to sockets when we start doing network operations we can still use print writers and they're really really low cost to use they don't take a lot of, of setup and stuff so let's um let's make a print writer and I'm just going to call it PW and I'm going to construct it okay so what should we call our file we're going to write into a file and I know at least one person will come up with a name of a file I don't have, which will be good. So give me a file name. Uh, we did Greg and 11 for rectangles. Give me a new file name. Or I'm just going to call it blurb. Greg the file. <laughs> Let's see if we can do that. <laughs> Flurb is good, yeah, or guacamole. Okay, so let's 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 see if we can make a file with a weird name that has like spaces and commas in it. I believe we can. Um, so so how do we put stuff into here? Um, All right, we'll just write some stuff into it. All right, now this will not compile for a few reasons. Number one, I need to import the print writer class. Which I believe comes from java.io. Yeah, java.io.printwriter. But even once we do that, it's still going to complain because unreported exception, right? We're trying to create a file and we may not be able to do that. So we got to use the try catch block that we had from yesterday. So I'm going to go ahead and put this constructor inside a try block. And I'll just say error creating output file. And I'll concatenate that argument E that was passed to the catch block. So we'll get some details about that error. And this looks pretty good. This is still not going to compile though. And this is an error you'll see a lot. I did that this morning too. This is the error you'll see a lot, right? Variable PW might not have been initialized. So we're at line 14 and line 14, I'm trying to use PW, but saying might not have been initialized. So why could it be that PW has not been initialized at this point in my code? What might be going on? Yeah, the constructor might have failed, right? 
So I'm constructing my print writer here and the return from that, the print writer object, I'm setting PW equal to that. But remember, this can throw an exception. And if it does, PW never gets a value. I jump down here instead. Now I can, I can band-aid that by setting PW equal to null, and now the compiler will say, oh, PW's got a value, right? But this is actually a really good cautionary uh, measure to me that, hey, you know, if I don't manage to succeed in constructing a print writer, I don't really want to do this statement. Because if PW is null, this will throw a null exception. So this, this reminds me that, you know, if I get an error creating the output file, I probably want to just give up. Or try again, or move to a different directory, or ask for a new file name, or something, right? But I don't want to just, uh, just go through and start using PW. So that's actually kind of saving me from myself. So yeah, we can return in the catch. And now this should compile. And let's see if we can actually run it. Looks like that worked, and there's a file called Greg the file. And if I VI it, it's empty. All right, so this is a bit of an issue. Why is my file empty when I said go ahead and print out hello there? Uh, it gets opened when we construct, but yeah, let's look at the print writer uh, class. And amongst all the methods we find in there, there's a close method. Close the stream and release any system resources associated with it. And it turns out that if you don't close this, the stuff that you've written to the print writer might not make it all the way to disk. So let's call pw.close and let's run java write and now Greg the file has 13 characters inside and what are those characters? Hello there. So this is really important, this call to close. So what's happening here? As I said, there's a whole bunch of different ways to do input and output in Java. And one of the big divisions for, for I.O. is buffered versus unbuffered. Um, print writers are built on top of what, what's a buffered system. Um, so here's the idea. Let's say I do pw.println hello. Okay, if I do system.out.println hello, it comes to my screen. If I do printwriter.println hello, I've created a file somewhere on disk. You know, here's my file. And I'd like this to go into my file. Well, that's not what happens. This basically writes into a buffer. And that buffer contains the string hello, with a new line at the end. And if I print something else, that will go in my buffer, and if I print something else, that will go in my buffer, and my buffer will save up all the stuff I want to put into the file until there's enough stuff that it's worth the time to actually take this and write it to the file. Because, you know, this is moving things around in memory. This is theoretically going off to this big heavy piece of metal that's spinning around 7200 times per second and trying to find when the right spot of that is underneath a read write head and then pump out electrical signals at just the right speed to code this information magnetically on this spinning platter. Except I have solid state drives in here, but you know. Um, so this is a really expensive operation. This writing into a buffer is very inexpensive. It's just twiddling values in memory. 
So your print writer basically saves stuff in memory until there's enough stuff that it's like, okay, it's going to take a lot of work, but, you know, I got a million characters here. I'm going to go ahead and write that to the file. So every now and then this buffer gets flushed onto the actual disk. If my program exits before this has gotten flushed out, my file may be empty. Now I can force this to get written out by calling a flush method. So if I say print writer dot flush, that will also force it out to the drive. Or if I close my file, that will force everything out. But in general, buffered output, you don't know when it's going to actually end up on, on the physical drive. And in, so, so for us, we just have to make sure we flush or close, right? But in practice, it's even more complex because even if I flush this out or I close it, I don't know if it's actually ended up on the physical medium that I'm recording on because the operating system itself has its own buffers. It has something like a disk cache. And even if I've closed my file and, and you know told the system, go ahead and write this into the file right now, it may not go onto the actual platter. Or if you have a flash drive, it may not go onto the actual um, flash drive itself. It may be sitting in this memory buffer or this disk buffer. And when does it get written to the file, to the actual flash device? When this cache gets filled up, or when time passes, or when you say, write this stuff out, or when you say eject. And so if you have a flash drive that needs to be safely removed, when you say safely remove it, part of what's happening is all the stuff that's cached up is actually getting written out. So you can get a flash drive and you can write, you know, a, a gigabyte of data to it, and it can look really quick comes back right away and says, all done, right? It's not really written to the flash device. It may be sitting in a cache, and then when you try to eject it, that's when it ends up taking five minutes, because that's when it's actually writing out to the physical medium. So that's, that's stuff you, you'll, you'll encounter in like an operating system course. Um, and there's, there's other layers here, and right, our memory has a, a whole hierarchy. When you write something into memory, you're not writing to the actual bits in your dynamic RAM. You're writing to a local cache. But eventually that gets flushed out and written to the DRAM. And that can go into a buffer and that can go into a disk cache and that can go into the actual physical medium. Man, I love SSDs. Um, and whatever the faster one is, MMCs or something, I don't know. I got this laptop on like impulse and it had this really fast drive and it's like I'm totally in love with it. Um, so without ODPs, our PA is the only thing we'll be doing this quarter in terms of assignments. Um, yeah, there's a few quizzes on Canvas. I'm hoping to put more quizzes up, um, but we'll see what I come up with. Um, but yeah, mainly your assignments are the programming assignments and then there's midterm and final. So it's, it's uh, lesser, um, fewer assessment items. Yeah, exactly. So don't try an SSD until you're ready to buy, because it will spoil you. <laughs> but on the other hand, who doesn't like, you know, having a spinning piece of metal inside your laptop? That's always fun. Um, all right, so, so any questions about that? So let me, let me mention one other thing. Um, oh, that's a pain. Um, I, I went through some sample code for this this morning. So if you want to see sample code, you can look at, at the video from this morning's class. Um, but um, let's talk about equality of strings. Suppose I have two strings, S1 and S2. In general, 
this is almost always going to return false. And this, this is a repeat of something we discovered in 224, 222 in particular. Um, in C, we could not use equal equal to compare two strings. And the reason was that a string in C is actually a memory address. And they could have one string S1 and another string S2, and they're stored at different locations in memory. And a statement like if S1 equals equals S2 basically says, is this string stored at the same location as that string? Because the value of the string is the memory location it's stored at. And so this didn't work for us in C. We had to do something like string compare S1, S2, and see if that returns zero. Okay, the same thing happens effectively in Java. We're not thinking about memory addresses, but if we think of S1 and S2 as objects, this statement says, is this object the same as that object? And it's not going to look in and say, yeah, they're different objects, but they both are strings with five characters, and the five characters are the same. That's a totally different question. This is a very direct, is this object the same as that object? And that kind of makes sense because there's so many different kinds of objects and so many aspects to these different objects, right? The only reasonable, consistent thing we could expect equal equal to do is say, are these the same object? So even if S1 and S2 are both the same string, contain the same letters, right? If they're different objects, this will always fail. So how do we test if two strings are the same? Um, use a method. So most classes, including the string class, come with a method called equal. So we could say string dot equals another string, and that will tell us if the two strings are the same. So instead of doing this, we could say if s1 dot equals s2, and that'll work fine. So S1 is a string, use its equals method, pass it an argument of S2. This returns true if the two strings correspond to the same sequence of characters, right? So the second argument can't be null, and it's a string that represents the same sequence of characters as the other string. All right, that's not going to come up in PA2, but it'll come up in PA3 and further. So it's something to keep in mind. And it's true for all objects, not just strings. <laughs> all right. Um, so any questions? So I want to dig into this, this try-catch business a little more tomorrow. Um, so this, this is a good enough try-catch block for most of what we're going to do. Try, put in the statement that you're attempting, and then catch. And we can usually just say exception with you know any object name that we want. And we'll come in here if something goes wrong. Um, but we can be more nuanced. In particular, if there might be more than one exception thrown from this statement, we can have a separate catch statement for each possible exception. And we can say, if this is a divide by zero exception, then do this. If this is an array out of bounds exception, do that. If this is some other exception that I haven't already named explicitly, then do this other thing. And so we can kind of create you know, a hierarchy of catch blocks to go with a single try block that will say, um, you know, do different things for different types of exceptions. And we can also have a catch-all block, which says, whether you succeed or fail in that try statement, do this one thing at the end. So we can put in kind of a, a final um, block that should be executed regardless of whether the try succeeded or we got an exception. So I'll, I'll go into the details of that tomorrow. Um, and then I want to start looking at um, putting together binary trees. And PA3 is going to involve binary trees. Um, and they're trees that we're going to have to create on our own. 
So they're not going to be your standard binary search tree. They're going to be a decision tree. So we're going to create those from the ground up. So I want to start looking at that code tomorrow and get us ready for PA3 on Friday. So, um, so that's where we're going um, the rest of the week. Um, and then we'll go on into more um, aspects of Java, including talking about class extensions, which will be um, a critical piece of PA4. All right, so good stuff coming up. Um, have a great afternoon. I will see you tomorrow.